City of Wishes, A Cinderella Story Episode 3, The Moonlight Masquerade Written by Rachel Morgan Narrated by Ariel Delisle Chapter 1 On a quiet street in Vale City's Willowton Borough, moonlight shone through a dusty attic window where Elle Winter stood blinking at the glamorous, white-haired fay woman perched on the end of her bed. It was surreal enough that the godmother herself was sitting in Elle's bedroom. Perhaps their entire conversation, and the godmother's presence, was actually a dream. Elle pressed her nails into her palms, and the pain felt very real. So, not a dream? I'm sorry, she said to the godmother. I know it's really late, so maybe I zoned out for a second and misheard you, but it sounded like you said you want me to kill the prince? Yes. Prince Chevalier of House Belmont. Elle let out a choke of a laugh. Is... is that a joke? The smallest of frowns marred the godmother's perfect features. I don't ever joke about the price of a wish. N no, Elle blurted out. I won't kill someone. You can't ask me to do that. Elle... You just told me how important it is that you wish for your freedom. That it's the only way you and your stepsister can run away together, and that she means more to you than anyone else. Has that changed within the last few seconds? No, of course not. But, I mean, you're asking me to commit murder. I am, the godmother said, as simply as if she were asking Elle to pick up something she just dropped on the floor. But this, this doesn't even make sense, Elle said, hoping to bring some rationality to the conversation. Why me? I'm not even allowed to go to the ball. Surely it's far less complicated if you ask someone who's actually going. There must be people summoning you for wishes all the time. I'm sure you'll find someone else in the next few days. I'm not asking someone else, Elle. I'm asking you. You can get close to him. And someone else can't? You can't? You're the godmother. You can do anything. Well, I'm flattered you think so. The godmother smoothed one hand over her perfectly styled hair. But there's a limit to the extent of my reach. Prince Chevalier has certain magical wards placed around him. Wards that specifically target me. I can't get close enough to him. It has to be you. Elle shook her head. I'm, I'm really not the right person for this job, she insisted, her voice trembling slightly as despair began to inch its way up her chest and into her throat. Even if I was happy to end someone's life, I would have no idea what to do. I'd mess up the whole thing. You are exactly the right person for this job. Your talents make you uniquely equipped. My talents? I know you're not entirely human, Estelle Winter. Excuse me? I'm definitely human. My blood is as red as any other human's. The godmother leaned back on one hand. Forgive me, that isn't quite what I meant. I know you're human, but I also know what you can do, and it isn't something any other human can do. For several moments, Elle was silent. She longed to ask when exactly she and the godmother had met, and how the godmother knew these things about her. But the mysterious woman had already made it clear she wouldn't answer questions about the past. About someone else's story, as she'd put it. Yes, okay, Elle said eventually. I can remove people's memories. I have no idea how I possess this strange magical ability while also being human, but that's the way it is. What does that have to do with killing the prince? Your power doesn't simply remove memories, the godmother said patiently. If you take it further, if you remove all memories, if you remove the mind itself, the body cannot survive on its own. Elle felt a sickening jolt in her stomach. What? How do you know that? You've done it before. I most certainly have not. 
You don't remember. You took the memory from yourself. Elle could only stare, her heart pounding, dread building inside her. That can't be true. I've... I've never used my ability on myself. She realized the absurdity of what she was saying as the words left her mouth. If she had taken a memory from herself, then of course she wouldn't remember doing it. Her clients had their memories of meeting with her. They knew she'd taken something, even if they didn't know what it was. But if she had done something terrible and then immediately removed that space of time from her own mind, she would have no way of knowing it ever happened if she didn't write herself a note or leave some other clue. The godmother let out a sigh. It honestly doesn't matter what you believe. What you've done in the past isn't relevant right now. My point is that you need no weapon. You need no killing expertise. You will simply do what you've been doing for years. You'll convince the prince to accompany you to a quiet spot away from all the activity of the ball, and then you'll take his memories and his mind to the point where he slips away from this world. Elle swallowed past the rising nausea in her stomach. And what if he doesn't want to follow me anywhere? What if I don't even have the chance to get near him? There'll be hundreds of women vying for his attention. And you will be the one to capture it. I'll make sure of that. And your hairstyle will hide the tips of your ears so he won't know you're human. Trust me, Elle. Prince Chevalier will follow you anywhere. But I... Elle trailed off. She'd run out of things to say used every argument she could think of, but it seemed the godmother wasn't open to negotiating. She'd decided on her price, and now Elle had to say yes or no. A noise reached her ears from downstairs. Elle looked over her shoulder, terror wrapping its fingers around her heart and squeezing tight. What would Salvia do if she walked in here and found the godmother? Don't worry, the godmother said. No one can hear us while I'm in this room. Now, I need your answer, Elle. Do you accept this price or not? Oh, I... Uh... Elle's scrambled thoughts tumbled over one another. Can I have a day or two to think about it? Don't you know the rules? The godmother asked. The hand of fear squeezed a little tighter. What rules? If you summon me and refuse to pay the price I set, you don't get to summon me again. That will be it. The end of all our dealings. But then it's a simple decision, Elle. This is what it comes down to. Who would you rather save? Your stepsister, who means the world to you, or a fey prince who is exactly like his father? You know how the royal family feels about humans. If it were solely up to them, no human would ever be free. I'm sure you're aware of how hard King Belleric has been working to get the National Council to vote in favor of making the slave charm mandatory for all humans once more. If he succeeds, all humans will be returned to slavery. His son has been working just as hard to get this proposed change voted in. What's wrong with removing a person like that from the world? I... I don't... Fine. The godmother rose from the bed. This meeting is over, then. I don't have time for... Wait, okay! She paused, raised an eyebrow. Okay? I'll do it, Elle said, her heart thumping so hard it hurt. Good. I'll see you on Saturday evening, then. She snapped her fingers, and an instant later, she vanished. Elle turned on the spot, just to make sure the godmother was really gone. Then she slowly sank down and sat right there on the floor, allowing herself to breathe freely for the first time in minutes. Was this real? Had she really just done that? Yes, she had. She'd lied to the godmother. And now she had to figure out how to pretend to kill Prince Chevalier. Chapter 2 
though she wasn't required to do household chores. Elle raised her weary, aching body from bed at the usual time the following morning. She may not have physical tasks, but her brain had work to do. It was Monday, and the ball was on Saturday. She had six days to figure out how to pretend kill a prince who would have hundreds of women, and probably at least a dozen guards, following him around. She also had no idea how she was going to get past the confinement charm on the attic, or what she would wear, or how she would actually get to Belmont Palace. But she assumed the godmother would take care of all the details. This whole go-to-the-ball-and-kill-the-prince thing was her idea, and she was well aware of Elle's situation. It was still early when footsteps sounded on the stairs leading up to the attic. Sienna, Elle thought instantly. Years of practice had made Elle an expert at identifying exactly which of her three family members was climbing the stairs. The footsteps stopped outside her door, and she listened for the sizzle of magic as the confinement charm was temporarily lifted. The handle twisted, and the door swung open. Sienna stood on the other side, a plate of toast in one hand. At the sight of the yellowish-brown patches on her face, Elle inhaled a quiet gasp of air. How badly must Salvia have beaten her if she still had visible bruises after a night of her fey magic working its healing power? Stars above, Elle whispered. Are you okay? What did she... Sienna thrust the plate at Elle, her eyes downcast. I'm fine. I can't talk. Mom is... What did I tell you, Sienna? Salvia shouted up the stairway. You are not to speak to her. You have taken too long already. I'm fine, I promise, Sienna whispered before pulling the door shut with a bang and reactivating the confinement charm. Elle stared at the door, her hand gripping the plate tightly as Sienna descended the stairs. If Salvia truly didn't want the two of them conversing, she wouldn't have allowed Sienna to come up here. She would have come herself, or sent Meredith. Or, more likely, she would have let Elle go hungry for a day or two. No, there was a reason for this. Salvia wanted Elle to see Sienna's bruises. She wanted Elle to see what her disobedience had resulted in. Any remaining doubts Elle had about bargaining with the godmother fled her mind. Whatever she had to do to convince everyone the prince was dead, for a few hours at least, would be worth it. She needed to get Sienna away from this house before Salvia took things too far. Before she hurt her own daughter so badly she might not recover. Elle carried the plate to her bed, sat down, and eyed the two pieces of toast covered in honey. Anger had robbed her of her appetite, but she wouldn't be helping anyone by not eating. Her brain needed food if it was going to function so she nibbled on the toast as she tried to figure out how she would trick the godmother. She spent most of the morning pacing the attic, ridiculous half-ideas flitting through her mind. If the godmother couldn't get close to the prince, how would she know if he was really dead? What if Elle gave him something to knock him out, hid him somewhere, and then started a rumor about him being killed? It would spread lightning fast among the ball's guests. By the time Elle got away from the palace, the rumor would probably have reached the godmother. She would want to know for sure. She'd probably wait for an official statement from the royal family before granting Elle her wish. So that wouldn't work. Elle passed her wardrobe for the hundredth time, then stopped. She stared at the closed doors, then pulled them open and dug out an old photo album from beneath her socks and underwear. Sitting on the edge of her bed, she flipped through the cardboard pages, yellow around the edges with age. She didn't often look at this album. Wandering through memories of the good old days was always bittersweet, but she felt she needed the encouragement of seeing her parents' faces. It was hard, but it would give her strength. The album began with pictures from the time her parents had only just met, mostly taken while they were hanging out together with friends and family. There was one of Dad with his brother, before his brother was killed in a car accident, and one of mom with her best friend, Liana, a woman who was Faye. Then a group photo with friends, 
a mixture of fae, humans, and shifters. Elle wondered what had happened to them all. She had vague memories of Liana and of the shifter with the beard. Eric? Merrick? Merrick, that was it. He was a wolf shifter. But Elle couldn't remember seeing much of Liana, Merrick, or the others after her mom died when she was six. Then Dad remarried soon after Elle turned seven, and she definitely didn't remember seeing any of his friends once Salvia was in the picture. Elle turned the page, shoving aside all thoughts of Salvia. They didn't belong in the same brain space that was dedicated to reliving happy memories of her parents. The following pages were filled with photos of holidays and fun dates and more hanging out with friends. Finally, she turned a page and landed on a photo from her parents' wedding day. Just one. There had been another album dedicated entirely to their wedding, and Salvia had made sure it disappeared soon after she married Elle's father. Elle lingered for a while on the wedding photo, smiling at her parents' faces filled with joy, Dad's hand around Mom, confetti raining down around them, and Mom's free hand raised as if she were about to catch some of the falling petals. Elle moved on and found a few photos of herself as a baby with her grandparents, none of whom were still around by the time Dad died, or they would surely have put a stop to Salvia's slave charm. And finally, a photo of baby Elle with both her parents. Elle traced her forefinger over her mother's blonde hair, wondering what secrets those smiling eyes hid. She tried to keep you from us. That was what Azrael had said. But why? It still made no sense to Elle that her mother was somehow involved with vampires. If anything, she would have guessed it was her father who had something to do with them, given the way he died. She tightened her hand into a fist and looked away, trying to focus on something else. The wardrobe, the window, the carpet, to blot out the heart-shattering memory of her father turning. She squeezed her eyes shut until all she could see was blackness. Then she opened them and looked down at the image of her smiling parents. That was the way she wanted to remember them. Not the pale skin and straggly hair of a woman struck by an incurable illness. Not the dull, unseeing eyes of a man who'd ended his life before the vampire transformation was complete. Elle placed her fingers over the photo once more. I'll figure this out, she promised them. Then she stood and returned the album to her wardrobe. Time passed achingly slowly as she paced the attic and tried to think her way out of this kill-the-prince mess she landed in. Occasionally, thoughts of Dex slipped in to distract her, which were far more pleasant than thoughts of murder. The memory of sitting in a lounge at the back of Apollo's apothecary, surrounded by colorful cushions and wild plants in mismatched pots, was so vivid if she'd had just a few more minutes with Dex, what might have happened? He'd wanted to kiss her. She had wanted to kiss him, too. And if she hadn't been so scared and silly, she would have had the chance before the stupid slave charm started burning her leg. Dex was probably immensely relieved the kiss hadn't happened, though, now that he knew the truth about her. She stopped at her window and pressed her forehead against the cool glass. There was a dull ache in her chest at the thought of never seeing him again, but at least she knew he was okay. Thank goodness for Cress and her dragon shifter speed and her skill at potions. Elle had never heard of anything like the strange, shadowy blackness that had darkened Dex's eyes and skittered across his skin and made him pass out. But Cress had come up with something to combat this strange affliction. And yet... There was something about the way Cress had spoken about Dex that left concern gnawing at the back of Elle's mind. Cress had said he was stronger than the darkness trying to eat away at him. Trying. Present tense. As if it was still happening. But hopefully, if he kept taking this potion Cress made for him, he'd be fine. Or maybe Cress could come up with something else to... Elle's thoughts crashed into one another and her heart jumped an extra beat or two as an idea popped into her head. Cress knew all about potions. She managed an apothecary brimming with elixirs and concoctions. 
The shelves in the back rooms had potion manuals and ingredient textbooks squeezed into the gaps between all the plants. Maybe, just maybe, she knew of a potion that could simulate death. Elle began pacing again, her bare feet crossing the attic faster now, and her breaths coming quicker. If she could slip a potion into the prince's drink that would make him appear to be dead for several hours, no, it would need to be longer than that, at least a day, then that would give her enough time to get away from the ball and for the godmother to confirm the prince's death and grant Elle's wish. Then Elle and Sienna could run, and they'd finally be free of Salvia, and by the time the godmother discovered Elle's deception, they'd be free of her, too. It seemed like a good plan, the best she'd come up with so far. The only problem was that she had no way of leaving the house and no way of contacting Cress. A familiar squeak caught her attention as she turned near her window. She looked back over her shoulder and saw a pixie, the one with that silly pistachio shell she wore as a hat, standing on the windowsill. She must have crawled through the open gap at the bottom of the window. The confinement charm, of course, had no effect on her. Oh, hey! Elle knelt by the window and placed her hands on the ledge beside the pixie. You're probably wondering why you haven't seen me in the kitchen or the pantry today. Sadly, I'm no longer allowed to leave the attic. The pixie stared with bright eyes the size of pinheads. One wing quivered. Elle sighed. You shouldn't hang around here. Seriously, you should find another home to live in. One where they don't kill pixies. I won't be the one working in the kitchen downstairs anymore. And if the new maid sees you and tells Salvia, you won't last long. She'll probably try to lure you into a pixie trap with a shiny button or something. The pixie took a step closer and placed her tiny hand on top of Elle's pinky knuckle. Then she patted it. Her hand was so small and light that Elle barely felt a thing. It was silly. But emotion welled up in her chest, and all of a sudden she felt like crying. Had her life really come to this? Were things so terrible that the only one left to provide her any comfort was a pixie? She sniffed and blinked her tears away. Thanks, she whispered. I hope you find a better home than this one. She stood and turned away. And then an idea clicked into place in her brain. Oh, wait! She swung back around. Wait, wait! You can understand me, right? She knelt down again and faced the pixie. Research suggested pixies understood the languages of the high races. It was the high races who struggled to understand pixies. Apparently, pixies could respond in the same language, but they spoke so fast and their voices were so high-pitched that it was impossible to make out much more than a squeak. Sienna had read up about it for one of her school subjects, and then told Elle all about the research she'd found. But if the research was correct, this pixie wasn't doing much to confirm it. She simply stared at Elle. Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes, Elle said, mainly because she didn't have any other options. Can you do something for me? Please, this is important, and I can't leave this house. The pixie continued to stare, which, again, Elle decided was a good sign. I need you to go to Apollo's apothecary. I'll write a note for you to take, and you must give it to Cress. Only Cress. Do you understand? The pixie patted Elle's hand a second time. Okay, great. You just wait there, and I'll quickly write a note. She hurried to her wardrobe and dug inside a box for a notebook and pen. Then she moved to the wooden table that stood near her bed and began scribbling down a message to Cress. Cress, I need your help. I need a potion that will simulate death. The drinker needs to appear to be dead for at least a day, longer if possible, but he needs to return to normal health when he wakes. If such a potion exists, I need it by Saturday afternoon. I have no money to pay you. I don't even have essence. It's all gone. But I'm desperate. More desperate than I can put into words. After the ball... I'll be free, and I'll do anything I can to pay you back. Work in the apothecary, collect ingredients, make potions, 
Whatever. Please. She signed the note simply with an E. Then, after a moment's pause, she added, Dex's friend, in brackets. She didn't add that she would also need Crest to hide her in Siena for a while. Cross that bridge when you reach it, she told herself. She tore the page from her notebook and folded it as small as she could. Are you able to carry this? She asked as she hurried back to the window. Crouching down, she held the folded note out to the pixie. The tiny creature reached for it with both hands before clutching it to her chest. Then she turned back to the window. Elle hastily lifted it so the pixie wouldn't have to squeeze through such a narrow gap at the bottom. The pixie raced forward and leaped into the air. Elle placed her hands against the invisible barrier of the confinement charm and watched her miniature ally zoom away, hoping this plan would work. Chapter 3 Nick folded his arms tightly across his chest as he surveyed Vale City from one of the vast windows of his father's apartment. The last rays of the setting sun slid across the city, but this building was already in shadow. Honestly, you're as useless as Azriel, his father said from behind him. A chair scraped the floor, and Nick guessed his father had just sat. You now have magic coursing through your vampire body, and you still couldn't catch a simple human girl last night. A human girl aided by Fay, Nick reminded his father. One helped her run. The others tricked us. He turned toward the table, his arms still tight against his body. They tricked you. Made you think you saw a man and woman fleeing from the warehouse. They didn't make me see anything. I definitely saw a man and woman hurrying away from that warehouse. Well then, they were a decoy. Fay who disappeared before I could find them. Or they were the girl and her fay friend and they managed to elude you. Nick turned back to the window and stared beyond the many buildings. Though it was small and distant, he had a good view from up here of Sovereign Hill and the palace that sat atop it, gleaming in the setting sun. The Allegiant would soon tear Belmont Palace to the ground. Every last stone would tumble into the sea, and a new age would begin. The Age of Vampires. He'd believed that soon might be only a matter of days away. Now he wasn't so sure. It doesn't matter what went wrong last night, he said quietly. We don't have the girl, which means we don't know what she knows. If we can't find her before Saturday... Oh, we're still going ahead with plans for Saturday, his father informed him. I received word this morning. Nick lowered his arms and faced the table. He moved closer, gripped the back of a chair, and leaned forward. Is that wise? We don't know how to finish the- You don't get to question your king, his father snapped. You screwed up, which means our plan isn't as perfect as it could be, but it can still work. We won't get another opportunity like this ball in a long time, which means we need to take advantage of it. And if there are negative side effects because we couldn't complete the spell, it's on you. Literally. And on everyone else who's gone through the process I went through, Nick muttered. We might all be too weak for this plan to succeed. The others will be fine. They began the process after you. If anyone's going to weaken before the ball, it's you. And if that happens, you're out. You won't be going. Nick worked hard to keep his hands from fisting. He'd worked so hard for this, practiced endless hours with his newly acquired magic. He wouldn't miss out on the biggest move vampires would make against the Fae in centuries. I'll be fine on Saturday night, he assured his father. I certainly hope so. When the true king rules this country, I plan for us to be handsomely rewarded. That's only going to happen if you don't let me down again. Nick pinned his gaze once more on Sovereign Hill. 
Trust me, I won't. Chapter 4 To L, the days passed by achingly slowly until finally Saturday arrived. Unfortunately, her pixie friend did not. Perhaps she hadn't understood a word Elle said. Perhaps all the research Sienna told Elle about was pure nonsense. Whatever the reason, Elle was left with no potion that could simulate death and no reasonable backup plan, and a great deal of panic threatening to overwhelm her. She had to keep closing her eyes, sitting on the edge of her bed, and taking deep, slow breaths. What's the worst that could happen? She kept asking herself. She would fail at paying the price, and the godmother wouldn't grant her a wish. That was all. Except that wasn't all. Her freedom was on the line, as was Sienna's, and possibly Sienna's safety. Sure, Sienna would be a legal adult in less than a year, free to leave home if she was brave enough to go against Salvia's wishes. But what if she didn't survive that long? What if Salvia's irrational anger caused her to do something before then that even magic couldn't heal? Footsteps echoed in the narrow staircase beyond the attic door. Elle turned toward the sound. Sienna? It didn't sound like Salvia or Meredith, but it didn't sound entirely like Sienna either. Elle moved from the bed and hovered near the door, waiting. Salvia's new maid had been delivering meals to the attic, and Elle hadn't seen Sienna since Monday morning, when they'd barely had two seconds to talk. She still wasn't sure if she should tell Sienna about the wish and the godmother's price. What if something went wrong and Elle's last remaining hope at freedom slipped through her fingers? The door opened, and for a moment or two, Elle didn't recognize the girl who stood on the other side. Hey, Sienna said quietly. Mom doesn't know I'm up here. She's busy with Meredith. She half turned and glanced down the staircase before facing Elle again. They're both taking far too long to get ready, and I doubt either of them would notice if a fire started or the house fell down or something exploded. Sienna, Elle said, the name leaving her lips on an exhale of breath. Her eyes traveled over Sienna's dress, which was a shimmering gray-green that perfectly complemented her auburn hair. The style was simple, a fitted bodice with a skirt that flared out slightly. But the lace detail Elle had seen across the back when Sienna turned was beautiful. With her usually wispy, out-of-control hair styled into a perfectly chic updo, she looked glamorous and elegant. That's... just... You look incredible. Do you think so? Sienna laughed. For the first time in my life, I actually feel, I don't know, pretty? Sophisticated? It's so weird. I'll have to try and not trip over something or spill anything on my dress. It looks amazing on you. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. Meredith keeps pointing out how simple my dress is in comparison to hers, but I actually prefer mine, even if it wasn't custom-made for me. And even if, as Meredith keeps saying, someone else is wearing the same dress, who cares? She shrugged. I'll just walk in the opposite direction if I see someone else wearing it. Elle smiled. I hope you manage to enjoy some of tonight, even though you'll be trying to keep Meredith away from the prince the whole time. I know. That would be nice, even though it's not a priority. Anyway, I just wanted to come up here and tell you that I'm determined not to fail. She pushed her shoulders back and gave Elle a firm nod. I'll do whatever I have to. Even if it means causing an embarrassing scene so Meredith and I are asked to leave. It's just, you know... Mom will probably punish one or both of us severely for something like that. So I thought I should warn you. Guilt struck Elle square in the chest. It's not as though you had any warning after she found my essence collection and punished you for it, she said quietly. Are you okay now? You still had bruises on Monday morning. 
she must have hurt you badly. I'm... yes, I'm fine, Sienna said, but her smile was strained and a shadow crossed her features. I'm so, so sorry about the essence, Elle. I can't imagine how... I mean, you worked so hard for it, and now it's all gone. And that must have been utterly heartbreaking. Elle nodded, still unsure whether she should mention the bargain she'd made with the godmother. It was a pretty low point for me, but listening to you being punished because of it was worse. No, that's not the worst of it, Sienna said with a shake of her head. Mom told me the next day that I couldn't go to the ball, that she was going to lock me in my room tonight while she and Meredith go out. I thought for sure Meredith's plan was going to work and the prince would end up proposing to her. But then Elon was here for dinner on Wednesday. Mom made me invite him because she's determined I'm going to con something valuable out of him. And he said he was looking forward to seeing me at the ball. And Mom couldn't very well tell him I wasn't allowed to go. He might have asked why, and she would have had to come up with a very good story. Besides, now she thinks tonight is an excellent chance for me to get closer to Elon. Sienna rolled her eyes. Which I'd love to do if I knew I wasn't going to have to steal from him at some point. Now I just want to stay away from the poor guy so he doesn't get caught up in one of Mom's plots. Elle sighed. I'm sorry, but maybe... Maybe you won't have to go through with the con. Sienna wrinkled her brow. Why? What do you... She looked over her shoulder as Salvia shouted her name. Oh, stars, I should go. Mom probably needs help squeezing into her dress. Or magically adjusting the size, more likely. She was way too optimistic about the amount of weight she thought she could lose since we received that invitation. Sienna, El said gripping her stepsister's shoulders and making a quick decision to tell her at least part of the truth. Something's going to happen tonight. At the ball. Something terrible. What? What do you mean? I can't be more specific. Elle, you're scaring me. Is it going to be dangerous for us to be there? Should I try to convince Mom we shouldn't go? No, no, you'll be fine. Besides, there's nothing on earth that could convince your mother to stay at home tonight. What I'm trying to say is, if this thing does happen, you need to get out of there as quickly as you can. Come back home and come up to the attic. Wait for me here. Wait for you? But where are you going? You can't get out. I can't explain. Just promise you'll do that, okay? Okay, yes, of course. Sienna! Right, gotta go. Love you. Sienna pulled the door shut before Elle could reply. She stared at it for a second or two before her shoulders drooped. She stepped forward, shut her eyes, and pressed her forehead against the door. Perhaps she shouldn't have said anything to Sienna, not when the chances were slim that tonight would actually end with the godmother granting Elle's wish. But part of her believed this could still work. There was still time. She could still come up with a brilliant plan that hadn't yet occurred to her. Like, like abandoning the ball, breaking into Apollo's apothecary, and stealing a wish. Then she wouldn't need the godmother. Ugh, that's a terrible idea, she moaned out loud. In response, someone squeaked at her. Elle whirled around, and there on her bed, as if her desperate thoughts had summoned the tiny creature, was her pixie ally. You came back, El said. She rushed across the room and knelt beside the bed so she was almost eye level with a pixie. The miniature winged woman handed her a tiny glass bottle with a small folded note tied to the side. El opened the note with shaking fingers. This potion isn't exactly legal. I almost ignored your request. But I like you, E, and I'm choosing to believe that your desperation is genuine. Since you're not killing anyone for real, I'm happy to help you. I hope this moves you forward in the journey toward your freedom. Add just a few drops of this potion to your target's food or drink, 
and he or she will pass out within minutes. Your target will appear to be dead and will remain that way for at least a day. Longer, if you use more of the potion. Good luck, and be careful. Elle wrapped her hand around the note and clutched it against her chest, her relief almost overwhelming her. Thank you so much, she said to the pixie. I wish you were big enough for me to hug you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You may have just saved my life, and I don't even know your name. The pixie squeaked. She swept one tiny hand through her short blonde locks before bobbing in a way that might have been considered a curtsy. I wish I could understand you. I'm sorry. It must seem to you that I'm speaking frustratingly slowly. In response, all she received was a shrug. I would call you pistachio, El continued, but that's kind of a mouthful. How about stash? Oh, or tosh. That's better. What do you think? The pixie patted her hand. Okay, we'll go with tosh. Then I can stop thinking of you as the pixie with the pistachio shell hat. Tosh bent over and plucked a loose silver thread from one of the stars on Elle's bedspread. Then she flew up to the top of Elle's wardrobe and disappeared from view. Payment? Elle wondered out loud. If so, she didn't mind. Tosh could have all the silver thread she wanted. Elle opened one of the wardrobe doors and hid the potion among her socks. Then she wandered over to the window and peered out. She watched the sun set. She watched Salvia, Meredith, and Sienna climb into a chauffeur-driven limousine. Meredith could barely fit through the limo door in her gigantic, puffy skirt, and Salvia's frilly, mermaid-style dress was so tight she had to shuffle rather than walk. The limo disappeared down the road, and Elle continued watching. Then she watched the moon rise higher and higher, until eventually the panic of the last few days began to grip hold of her again. Where was the godmother? What if she had forgotten all about her deal with Elle? Estelle. Elle jumped at the sound of the familiar voice, almost knocking her head against the window. How did the darn woman appear so silently? Not a footstep, nor a sizzle of magic, nor even a breath. Ready for a party? The godmother asked as Elle turned to face her. She was leaning against the wardrobe, her arms folded, and one high-heeled ankle boot crossed in front of the other. Elle couldn't help frowning. I thought you'd be here sooner. I'm already late for the start of the ball. Exactly, my dear. There's no other way to make an entrance. Chapter 5 Right then, the godmother said pushing away from the wardrobe and walking toward Elle. This shouldn't take long. She snapped her fingers near Elle's hair, then again in front of Elle's face. Elle blinked and coughed as the smell of powder filled her nose. And her hair was no longer hanging lifelessly down her back. What did you just... The godmother snapped her fingers a third time, and a mirror with a pretty silver frame appeared on her open palm. She held it up with both hands in front of Elle's face. Elle blinked at her reflection. Her makeup was flawless, eyes startlingly blue amid shimmering dark eyeshadow, cheekbones perfectly accentuated, full lips painted dark red, and her hair appeared to have been partially French braided before being expertly gathered up at the nape of her neck, all within the span of about two seconds. Stars above, she whispered. That was fast. I'm the godmother, darling. Did you expect anything less? It's just... Most fey have to speak spells out loud or wait for magic to appear in their hands, El said. But you didn't say a word, and I didn't see any fairy dust either. I've had plenty of time to perfect all the magic any fairy could ever dream of using, including the visualization of spells as opposed to utterances. And fairy dust itself isn't actually necessary. Plenty of time, Elle repeated silently. As the godmother tapped her chin with one shiny black fingernail and scrutinized Elle from the neck downward, Elle wondered if the rumors were true. 
the rumors that said the godmother had used wish magic to extend her life beyond that which was normal for the Fae. And Fae had long lives to begin with. Exactly how old are you? she asked. Oh! The godmother clenched her hand, an affronted look on her face. You never ask a woman her age. Right, sorry. With another finger snap, Elle's jeans and t-shirt vanished, leaving her standing in only her underwear. Underwear, she noted with surprise, that was brand new and far prettier than anything she owned. Is, um, the finger snap necessary? She asked, mostly to divert attention from her near nakedness. Not at all. The godmother snapped her fingers once more, and layers of soft blue fabric sprouted out of nowhere and wrapped themselves around Elle's form. But that doesn't mean it isn't fun. The fabric tightened itself around Elle's chest and waist while growing more voluminous around her legs. More layers than Sienna's dress, but nothing near the size of Meredith's monstrous gown. Oh, and shoes, the godmother added with an effortless twirl of her fingers. Elle felt her heels rise as something rigid formed around her feet. Take a look, the godmother said. Elle realized the hand mirror was now floating in the air, and within seconds it had expanded to the size of a door. Elle gaped at her reflection. From its sweetheart neckline and off-the-shoulder sleeves to its cinched waist, the dress fit her perfectly. Perhaps it was the way the moonlight shone in through the window, but the dress seemed almost to glow, and tiny pinpricks of light glistened within the fabric like stars in an early evening sky. A string of diamonds sparkled around her neck, and in her right hand was a mask of delicate silver filigree. It's absolutely magnificent, she breathed. Is it my imagination, or are the stars in the fabric actually twinkling? It's not your imagination. And neither is the subtle glow of moonlight emanating from the dress. Of course, there will be other girls wearing dresses with magic woven into them, but I like to think you'll stand out in a creation that's not only stunning, but perfectly fits the theme. Moonlight masquerade, Elle whispered. Exactly. The only thing, she added, trying to wiggle her toes. She lifted the skirt and looked down to see glittering crystal heels encasing her feet. She raised her eyes and met the godmother's gaze in the mirror. The woman pinned her with a glare. The only thing is what? She demanded. Well, the shoes are quite uncomfortable. I'm not sure I'll be able to walk in them. Well, then, the godmother clapped her hands, and the discomfort vanished. You can go barefoot. Oh, I didn't mean... Those are the shoes, Elle. Take them or leave them. I've used enough magic on you already. Well, can't I just wear some of my own shoes? The godmother tipped her head back and laughed. You think you have something appropriate? No but it's not like anyone's going to see them. Elle placed the mask on her bed before swishing her way to her wardrobe. She pulled the doors open, and her eyes fell on her rhinestone-studded combat boots. Perfect, she thought as she reached for them. They were, after all, her favorite shoes. More importantly, they would give her somewhere to hide the potion. Stars help me. The godmother muttered as Elle grabbed a pair of socks and the tiny potion bottle. This girl has zero fashion sense. It's fine, Elle assured her as she sat on the edge of her bed. Like I said, no one will see them. She pulled the skirt up, put her socks on, and surreptitiously slipped the potion bottle into the top of the right sock. Then she pulled the boots on. Those might be the most hideous shoes I've ever seen, the godmother commented. I love them, Elle replied. She stood and let the skirt fall down to cover her feet. See? All gone. No one will ever know. And if someone does see them and comments on how hideous they are, I promise I won't tell them it was the godmother who dressed me. 
she looked up with an innocent smile. The godmother narrowed her eyes. As long as you can kill the prince while wearing them, I don't particularly care what you choose to put on your feet. Elle's smile vanished as quickly as if someone had dumped ice water over her head. Of, of course, I can do that. Good. Why do you want him dead? She blurted out. The godmother merely stared. Right, Elle muttered. None of my business. Exactly. Now I think it's time to get you to the ball. Elle nodded. I assume you can take care of the confinement charm on the attic? Taken care of already, the godmother said. And as long as you're back in here by midnight, there won't be a problem. But if it's gone, then why? Because that is the time limit I've set for you, Elle. I can't have you taking all night trying to decide if you can really do this or not. At midnight, if you're not already back in this attic, magic will bring you back. I'll meet you here. If you've paid your price, I will then grant your wish. But what if something goes wrong and it takes me longer to complete the task than expected? Well, then you'll wind up back in this attic without having completed your side of our bargain. I won't grant you a wish, you'll still be a slave, and the confinement charm will reappear. But please stop arguing with me. Your task is not that complicated, and you'll have more than enough time. Just get it done, and everything will be fine. Can you handle that? Just get it done. It should be easy. The potion should work. But what if it didn't? What if L put it in his drink and nothing happened? What if she was left with no other option but to do as the godmother asked and actually kill the prince? As she stared at the woman, L wondered if she could actually go through with that. To be honest, she didn't know. She wouldn't know until she was faced with the certainty that there was no other way out. Will it hurt him? She asked quietly. Will he feel pain? When I take all his memories, I mean? When I take his whole mind? No, the godmother said, and Elle wasn't brave enough to ask if she was lying. Now, she clasped her hands together. Time to go, and don't forget your mask. She moved toward the bed, and the mask floated up to meet her hand. She half turned toward Elle, then paused. She stared at the bed with a frown. What? Elle asked. The godmother looked up and flicked her hand. The mask spun lazily through the air toward Elle. Nothing. I like the quilt. That's all. Oh, okay. That was weird. She caught the mask as the godmother raised her hand, smiled a glossy-lipped smile, and snapped her fingers. The room vanished. Something jolted Elle's body, and when her surroundings reappeared, she was standing on the sidewalk in front of her house. She took in a gulp of air and pressed her free hand to her chest. That, um, didn't feel so good. My apologies. I always forget that humans don't respond well to being hurtled through space by magic. As Elle took another few breaths and felt her body return to normal, she glanced both ways along the road. The police were no longer patrolling this street, and though it had been almost a week since she was locked in her attic, there was always the possibility of a hopeful vampire or two hanging around, waiting for her to leave her house. Looking for something? the godmother asked. Just checking things out? Vampires can no longer see this street, in case that's the thing you were checking for. They, what? What do you mean? They simply walk right past it from the street on one side to the street on the other. As simple as that. Elle blinked as her eyebrows pulled into a frown. But I heard you had some vampire problems on this street. I thought I should take care of that for you. 
Elle was about to ask how the godmother had heard of the vampire attack, and why she even cared, but she knew without opening her mouth that she wouldn't get answers. So all she said was, Thanks? Good, that's what I was hoping you would say. And now for some transportation. She rubbed her hands together, then spun her arm in circles before sweeping it out to the side. The distant roar of a revving engine reached Elle's ears. Before you ask, the godmother said, the answer is no. The hand gesture wasn't necessary. But I enjoy a good flourish. The engine roar grew louder, and seconds later, a streamlined, low-slung vehicle zoomed into L Street and came to an abrupt halt in front of her house. A sports car? L asked, unable to keep the doubt from her voice. Yes, isn't it fabulous? I haven't conjured up one of these in ages. It's pumpkin orange, L pointed out. It is. It's probably visible from the moon. Would you prefer to walk? The godmother asked, her tone icy. No, no, not at all. I'm happy with the flashy orange car. It's just, you know, not exactly subtle. No, it is not. The godmother waved her hand and the passenger door opened. I never intended for your arrival at the ball to be subtle. Now, climb in. You'll find it a little more spacious than most sports cars. I had to make room for your lovely dress. Having never been inside a sports car of any kind, Elle had nothing to compare the interior space to. But the seat was comfortable, perfectly molded to her body, in fact, and there was plenty of room for her dress. There was also a noticeable lack of anyone resembling a driver. Um... Don't worry, the car knows where to go. I hope you have fun tonight, Elle, she added, placing one hand on top of the car and leaning down to peer at Elle. Other than the murder part, of course. Though that can be fun, too, if you let it. Ah, uh, Elle couldn't think of a single thing to say to that. Anyway, I have other wishes to attend to. The godmother tilted her arm and narrowed her eyes at the gold watch on her wrist. Not a watch, Elle corrected herself as she caught a glimpse of the circular face that had tiny images flashing across its surface instead of a clock face. Yes, things are looking busy tonight. What do you do if multiple people summon you at the same time? Elle asked, the thought only occurring to her now. And what if people summon you while you're asleep? El, my dear, you can't possibly think this is a one-woman show. You're aware that I run an entire empire based on the trade of wishes? I have many people who work for me. They answer the summons if I'm busy. They liaise with me, communicate prices, follow up on whether the other party has completed their side of the deal. Then I grant the wishes. Not everyone is lucky enough to spend so much time with me. You should be honored that I've taken such a personal interest in your situation. Honored. Or scared, Elle thought. And you've never been worried that you'll be caught? That someone's wish is actually a trap for you? That your whole empire, as you call it, will come crashing down around you? Is that a threat? No! Not at all, Elle hastened to say. I need a wish, and you're the one giving it to me. I'm not about to mess that up. At least I hope I'm not, she added silently. Some have tried to betray me over the years, the godmother said. It's never worked out well for any of them. A shiver zipped its way along Elle's arms. Would the godmother see it as a betrayal if Elle managed to successfully trick her tonight? Hopefully not. Elle wasn't threatening the godmother's empire in any way. And she kind of technically was following through on her side of the bargain. She would kill the prince. If only for a few hours. 
One last thing, the godmother said. I've added a little something to the magic I've placed on you to help you locate the prince. Oh, but I doubt I'll have any trouble locating him. I'm sure it'll be obvious who he is. I'm sure it will be, but the ballroom will be crowded and everyone will be vying for his attention. He'll be moving around, dancing with numerous women. And everyone will be wearing masks. You may find it hard to get to him without a little magical assistance. Okay, Elle said with a shrug. Whatever you think is best. And don't do that, dear, she added, placing a hand lightly on Elle's shoulder. Princesses don't shrug. But I'm not a... Doesn't matter. Prince Chevalier needs to think you could be. She stepped back, waved, and the car door swung shut. The engine revved. Then, in a rush of speed, the pumpkin orange sports car shot forward, carrying Elle toward the ball and her last hope at freedom. Chapter 6 Belmont Palace sat in all its glittering glory beneath twinkling stars and a crescent moon, making Elle feel as small as Tosh the Pixie as she stood in front of it. Her mouth fell open while her eyes traced over towers, domes, pillars, statues, and a vast sweeping staircase. She definitely didn't belong in a place like this. And yet, she'd had no trouble getting through the massive gate about halfway up Sovereign Hill. Several guards and a glowing barrier of magic had stopped her car, and Elle had just about had heart failure when the driver's window slid down and a guard peered inside, saying, Invitation, please. She'd held her breath, barely moved, and stared at the empty driver's seat, hoping something magical would happen. And something magical must have happened, because several moments later, the guard said, Perfect, thanks. Go ahead. Then he stepped away from the car. The magic barrier disappeared, and Elle continued her journey up a magnificent rosebush-lined driveway. The car dropped her off at the foot of the staircase leading up to the grand entrance, which was where she currently stood, gawking at the magnificent palace and seriously rethinking her level of bravery. Could she really do this? Yes, you can, she told herself firmly. It's just a party. He's just a guy. And it's just a few drops of a potion. She raised the delicate silver mask to cover the upper part of her face and tied the ribbons behind her head. Then she ascended the stairs. Inside, she passed between two lines of uniformed fae, a mixture of men and women, all standing perfectly upright with their hands clasped together in front of them. Feeling about a thousand percent awkward, Elle kept her gaze pointed forward. Unless someone stepped in front of her, she wasn't about to stop moving. Pretend you belong here, she reminded herself as she swallowed. You do this all the time. You have confidence. And you most certainly are not wearing cheap, chunky combat boots beneath this gorgeous ball gown. The last man in the right-hand line of Faye extended one arm toward another staircase on the other side of the vast hallway. That way, my lady. Elle glanced at him and inclined her head in a small nod. Perhaps this was the way it worked for every guest, or perhaps it was a product of the godmother's magic. Elle didn't care. She continued forward at the same pace, though it took all her willpower not to break into a run to get away from the fae she knew were watching her. She could have managed it pretty easily in her combat boots. She was grateful she'd chosen them, despite the fact that they were completely out of place. She never would have made it up all those stairs outside, and now another staircase inside, in those crystal heels the godmother had conjured up. At the top of the stairs, she was directed by another two fay toward a pair of closed doors, large and intricately inlaid with patterns of gold. As she approached, the two men standing in front of the doors straightened a little. They pushed their shoulders back and lifted their chins, and Elle remembered that she was late. These men probably didn't think they'd be opening the doors again until guests started to leave later tonight. After a curious glance in her direction, they each reached for a door handle. 
The door swung open, and Elle was finally at the Moonlight Masquerade Ball. She stepped through the doorway and looked around. A staircase, yes, more stairs, led down to the main part of the ballroom, which was filled with beautiful people in extravagant clothes. But it was the ceiling of the ballroom that caught Elle's attention. Or rather, what the ceiling was enchanted to be. It appeared that the ballroom was open to the sky, and an enormous moon, far bigger and fuller than the real moon outside, illuminated the room in silvery light. Tiny stars glittered all around the moon, as well as within the walls and the glossy marble floor, which Elle caught glimpses of as the guests mingled and danced. Floating globes of golden light added to the moon's glow, ensuring the ballroom was well lit. Elle moved forward. She wasn't royalty or nobility, so nobody announced her arrival in the ballroom. She'd heard that was the thing the Fae liked to do, but she noticed dozens of heads turning toward her as she descended the stairs. She was grateful for the mask that partially concealed her face. Her family had never seen her dressed in such finery, and with her face half covered, there was no way on earth they'd recognize her. The crowd made way for her as she reached the ballroom floor. The godmother would be pleased if she were here. She'd hoped Elle would stand out enough to grab the prince's attention. Elle hadn't thought about the fact that this meant grabbing everyone else's attention, too. How was she supposed to put a potion into the prince's drink if half the people here were watching her? But as she swished her way through the crowd, the head slowly turned away from hers and back toward whatever they'd been focused on before she arrived. Conversation or dancing or prince watching. They were mostly fey, Elle noted, but she spotted a few vampires and shifters. At least, she assumed they were shifters and not humans. Based on all the gossip she'd overheard while out running errands for Salvia last week, before she was permanently confined to her attic, the royal family was making a show of being inclusive by inviting certain vampires and shifters. But they hadn't stooped so low as to include any humans on the guest list. Oh, and there was Sienna! Elle almost called out to the girl in the gray-green dress and butterfly-shaped mask before reminding herself it was better if Sienna didn't know she was here. There would be far too much explaining to do otherwise. Besides, she was currently dancing with someone, and it looked as though she was actually having a good time. Though this someone was not Elon, Elle realized as she noticed the young man's very tanned skin. Elon was as pale as Sienna, and only a little taller than her. This guy was... Hang on. Was it Dex's friend, Xander? Elle took a closer look at Sienna's dance partner. He wasn't wearing a mask, and when he turned again, it was easy to see that it was him. Elle frowned with disapproval. Xander seemed like a nice enough guy, but he also liked to hunt vampires and operate outside the law. He would only be trouble for Sienna. Besides... Wasn't he too old for her? Elle guessed he was in his early 20s, while Sienna was only 17. She shouldn't be getting involved with... Elle caught herself mid-thought and almost laughed at her overprotective instincts. She had nothing to worry about. It was just a dance. Besides, she and Sienna would be on the run later tonight, tomorrow morning at the latest, and neither of them would have time for troublemaking boys while trying to hide from Salvia and the godmother. The more important question was this. Why wasn't Sienna working to keep Meredith away from the prince? Elle continued in the direction most of the crowd seemed to slowly be moving. That was surely the direction in which she'd find Prince Chevalier. And only then did her thoughts take the logical next step they should have immediately taken the moment she saw Xander. If he was here, maybe Dex was too. No, you have to focus, she told herself firmly. She was here to pretend kill a prince, hopefully before he got a chance to lay eyes on Meredith, not to find the guy she'd almost kissed and then run away from. Have you had a chance to dance with him yet? The question wasn't louder than any of the other voices nearby, but it was the chilling familiarity of it that grabbed Elle's attention. She inhaled sharply and turned away from the source of the voice. Salvia. How? In an entire ballroom crowded with people, had she managed to almost bump into her horrid stepmother so quickly? 
No, a second familiar voice exclaimed. That was Meredith. Elle kept her face turned away and her ears tuned to their voices. I only just got out of the bathroom, Meredith added. That custard was super sticky, and the cleaning spell took forever. I swear Sienna did it on purpose. She'll be punished, don't worry, Salvia said. When I find her later. Ugh, I haven't even seen the prince yet, Meredith complained. I can't get close enough. He's the one in the gold mask. It's covering most of his face. I know. I heard something about a gold mask. I just haven't seen anyone wearing it yet. Gold mask, Elle thought. Good to know. And well done, Sienna, for spilling food on Meredith's dress. She moved away from Salvia and Meredith as quickly as she could, heading for the center of the room where the dance floor was located. Whenever groups of people stood on tiptoe and stared in a certain direction, she altered her course slightly. If she followed the crowd's attention, she would find him eventually. Or, hang on, why was the crowd parting again? Nobody was turned toward her this time, so... Holy stars, he was coming toward her. A man in a gold mask. Prince Chevalier of House Belmont himself. Was it really going to be this easy? He was coming to her? Suddenly, she wanted to flee in the opposite direction. She couldn't do this. How exactly had the godmother expected her to lead the prince away to a quiet corner and use her special ability on him? There were no quiet corners in a ballroom of a thousand gossiping voices and two thousand gawking eyeballs. Hi, the prince said, stopping in front of her. His mouth was visible, but the mask, which was solid, unlike the intricate wire work of her own, covered most of the rest of his face. Hi, she answered, but her voice was so quiet even she couldn't hear it. She cleared her throat and tried again. Hello. I saw you come in, he said, on the stairs. It's daring of you to arrive so late to a royal function. Oh, right, I'm so sorry about that. Car trouble, it arrived late to pick me up. Your Highness, er, uh, Royal Highness, she added hastily at the end. That was something she should have gone over with a godmother. How to properly address a prince so she didn't offend him within seconds of meeting him. It's fine, you don't have to worry about being so formal, he said with a laugh. And I admire the fact that you were still brave enough to come inside, even though you were so late. Do you want to dance? Oh, crap. Oh, stars. Why hadn't it crossed her mind that she might actually have to dance tonight? Like formal dancing with formal steps. Why hadn't she discussed this part with the godmother? It probably would have been a simple spell, just another snap of the godmother's fingers. If only she thought to mention it. I can't dance, she blurted out. Maybe can we talk? Talking's good, too. I'm quite tired of all the dancing, actually. Should we move out of the way? Sure, she said, though it was hardly necessary. He could have planted himself in the center of the dance floor and everyone would still have parted around him. They walked together toward the edge of the ballroom, and something niggled at the back of Elle's mind as she snuck sideways glances at the prince. There was something familiar about him. The way he held himself the shape of his face, the color of his hair. He looked almost like, but it couldn't be. They stopped moving, and in a rush of bravery and shock, Elle reached up and tugged the prince's mask away. Chapter 7 You're... But it wasn't him. She'd been so sure for a moment. So sure that the fey prince she was standing in front of was actually Dex. But of course it wasn't him. What a crazy notion. It didn't even sound like him, though with all the noise in the ballroom, it had been difficult to tell. Excuse me, Prince Trevalier said, stepping hastily away from her. She caught a glimpse of his disapproval before he slid his mask back into place. 
I'm afraid this conversation is over. He turned and strode away, and Elle felt her hope slipping through her fingers like fine sand. No, this is not over yet. She could still make this work. She crouched down and pulled the tiny potion bottle from her right sock. Clutching it against her palm, she hurried after the prince. She probably looked ridiculously desperate, but she'd already made a fool of herself in front of him. How much worse could things get? I'm so, so sorry, she gasped, pushing past several women and placing herself in the prince's path. You said you admire my bravery, so I thought, I mean, well, we all know why we're here. We know you're supposed to be choosing someone to marry. But if you and I can't even see each other, then how can we really know each other? And how can you choose someone from this room if you don't actually know any of us? To Elle's great surprise, the prince paused instead of running in the opposite direction. She wished she could see his expression. That's probably the most honest thing anyone said to me tonight, he told her. But why does it matter what we look like? I think it's far more important to get to know one another without our outward appearances getting in the way. True, Elle admitted. Darn, that was actually a good point. Why did she have to blurt out something that made her sound so shallow? The masks just feel like additional barriers between us, that's all. As if they're helping us pretend to be someone we're not. But when the masks are removed, we have to be ourselves. That sounded good, didn't it? Hopefully, it was a believable enough excuse for why she'd so abruptly pulled his mask off. At least have a drink with me, she said as a waiter approached the prince with a tray of champagne flutes. One glass of champagne. They don't even have that much in them, she added, eyeing the bubbly liquid in the glasses. It's not like you'll be stuck with me for long. The prince actually smiled. I suppose one drink wouldn't hurt. He looked at the waiter and asked, They've been checked? He gestured to the glasses. Yes, your highness. The waiter responded, You can confirm with Lord Hinton. He looked over his shoulder, and the prince followed his gaze. Elle tried to see over the tops of people's heads, but before she could locate whoever the prince was looking at, he stepped forward and lifted two glasses from the tray. He handed one to her, and she took it, sensing her fingers shaking. Hopefully, he didn't notice. Now or never, she told herself, just get this thing done. She took a step to the side and pretended to stumble over something. Oh, oops! She made a show of looking down near her feet for this imaginary something, and the prince followed her gaze. With her eyes still peering down and her hands holding the glass close to her chest, she flicked the tiny cork out of the top of the potion bottle and quickly tipped the contents into her own champagne. I don't see anything, she said, frowning at the floor. Then she laughed, hoping it didn't sound as fake to him as it did to her. Probably just my own clumsiness. Here, would you hold this for me? She handed her glass back to him. I just want to straighten the bottom of my dress. Oh, okay. There was nothing to straighten, but Elle spent a few moments crouching down anyway fiddling with the layers of fabric while stealthily wiping the potion bottle free of her fingerprints. She dropped it on the floor somewhere near her feet. All good, she said as she straightened. Thank you. She reached out and took the glass without the potion. She saw the prince start to protest, to tell her the other glass was hers, but he stopped. Probably for the same reason she would have chosen to say nothing. Neither of them had actually drunk anything yet. It didn't matter whose glass was whose. They were exactly the same, as far as he knew. Cheers, Elle said, raising her glass quickly and taking a sip before the prince could say anything. Oh, this is delicious, she rambled and drank again. The prince's eyebrows rose the tiniest bit, but he lifted his glass, and Elle watched as a decent amount of potion-laced champagne slid past his lips. Yes! She almost shouted out loud with glee, but somehow managed to keep her mouth shut. It was a little harder, though, to keep her triumphant smile to herself. She sipped her champagne again to try to cover the smile and ended up choking a little. The prince's eyebrows climbed a fraction higher. Wonderful. 
She was digging herself a deeper and deeper hole here. Not that it mattered. She'd done what she came here to do. Now she just had to wait a few minutes to make sure it worked. You okay there? Prince Chevalier asked. Yup, all good. I'm just enjoying the champagne so much. Oh, dear stars, stop talking now. The prince's mouth quirked up on one side. What's your name? I'm, uh, Trixie Gold. She'd come scarily close to using her real name. She needed to stop sipping the champagne. Gold, interesting. Is that a fey name? Crap. She let out a giggly, high-pitched laugh. Last time I checked. Well, Trixie Gold, I'd love to spend a little more time with you. I really would. But I can see some of the other ladies around us getting impatient. Oh, yes, of course. I wouldn't want to hug your attention for too long. And she definitely didn't want to be the one standing in front of him when the potion started working. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening, the prince said. And after a final nod, he walked away and greeted another woman. Elle let out a long breath, placed her glass on a passing tray, and began to inch her way toward the edge of the ballroom while still keeping the prince in her line of sight. What exactly had Cress's note said? The potion should start working within minutes, right? But roughly how many minutes? She wished Cress had been more specific. The prince hadn't finished all the champagne in his glass, but that shouldn't be a problem. She tossed more than just a few drops in there. But what if the darn thing didn't actually work? How long did she need to wait before confirming this? But then the prince staggered forward. He caught himself against the woman he was currently talking to, who didn't seem to mind in the least that Prince Chevalier of House Belmont was currently using her to prop himself up. Then he lurched to the side and landed on his knees. Gasps filled the air, accompanied by a few laughs from people who obviously thought he tripped. A shout reached Elle's ears. She assumed it was something to do with the prince, someone calling for help or shouting to ask if he was okay. But when more shouts joined the first and the undulating motion of a flag, a flag? caught her eye. She realized the shouts had nothing to do with Prince Chevalier. In the center of the dance floor, a small group of people were raising colorful flags and banners with words written in bold black letters across them. End the slave charm, and humans are our equals, and freedom, everyone's right. People jumped and waved their flags, tugging fake ear tips off to reveal that they were human. Though it appeared there were fae among their number as well. And even a vampire or two? Oh, stars, Elle muttered. She was fully in support of their cause, but this was not the time to start a protest. It would only anger the king, and he was already opposed to the idea of free humans. Not to mention someone was probably about to discover that Prince Chevalier was dead. That would not look good for the anti-slavery campaign. It was definitely time to get out of here. She shuffled back a little more. She was on the side of the ballroom opposite the staircase, where arched doorways led into the garden. Uniformed Faye stood beside each arch, but they didn't appear to be stopping anyone from walking outside. It was probably easier to leave that way than to try to get past the protesters and across the crowded room to the stairs. She was about to turn toward the garden when someone caught her eye. Someone with red eyes and blonde hair and a dark blue mask that covered only part of his face. It had been dark on the bridge that night in Belgravia, but she'd seen his face in the glow of unnatural magic that rippled off his body and she recognized it instantly now. Fear froze her to the spot. Nick. Elle's eyes slid down, and as Nick pushed his way between the ball's guests, she made out the faint glimmer of fairy dust somewhere near his hands. Then another gold flicker grabbed her attention. Another vampire, unsmiling, inching through the crowd, without speaking to anyone. And there was a third, she noticed suddenly. And with everyone's attention focused on the protest, it seemed no one noticed these strange vampires in their midst, slowly making their way toward... the fallen prince? Oh no, Elle whispered, 
No, no, no. There were Allegiant vampires right here in this ballroom. Things were going to go south very quickly. She had to get away. And she had to get Sienna out of here, too. She spun around. Where are you? Where are you? She muttered. As soon as she found her and they got to the edge of the ballroom, she could yell out a warning about the... What was that? There, on the far side of the ballroom, was the shimmer of a gray-green dress. The one Elle had been looking out for. Sienna was running up the stairs and away from all the commotion. Of course, Elle realized because that's what she had told her to do when something went wrong tonight. Sienna must think she'd been referring to the protest. Well, Sienna was safe then. Now Elle only had to worry about herself, and a ballroom full of innocent people. She turned toward the garden and pushed against the crowd to get to the closest archway. Excuse me, sir, she said to the fairy who stood guard there. Do you see that vampire there? She pointed behind her. And those two there? Oh, stars, and there's another one. They have magic, and they're heading for the prince. They're... She was interrupted by a blood-chilling scream. The fey guard launched away from her, magic glowing all around him. Elle didn't wait to find out what would happen next. She grabbed handfuls of her skirt and raced into the garden. At the sound of footsteps and screams behind her, she threw a glance over her shoulder and saw she wasn't the only one fleeing this way. She hesitated and slowed, watching as most people ran left around the outside of the building. Was that the quickest way to get back to the front of the palace? These people would surely know better than her. But seconds later, a gold mesh-like barrier appeared in the air, blocking the path of everyone running around that side of the palace. Probably all part of tonight's security, Elle thought. Maybe there were private buildings that way. She took off in the opposite direction, skirting around a fountain and keeping her eyes peeled for an open door or window. It might be that the only way back to the front of the palace was to go through it. In fact, now that she thought about it, that made sense. The royal family wouldn't want people wandering around the entirety of the palace grounds. They'd probably enclosed a small section of the garden for guests to enjoy, while making sure to keep the rest private. She wouldn't be surprised if that magic barrier she'd seen arced through the garden and came back around to meet the other end of the palace, in which case she would run into it sooner or later. Something made her slow near a trellis covered in climbing roses. Had she seen something move there? She couldn't be sure, but some instinct made her want to take a closer look. She hurried to the trellis and carefully pushed aside several white roses, careful to avoid the thorns. She expected to see bricks there. After all, the trellis was secured directly to the palace wall. But instead, she found a door. Yes, she whispered. She hooked her fingers into the diamond shapes of the trellis and tugged on it. It swung away from the wall easily, and she realized it had hinges on one side. It was meant to open and close. She reached for the handle and turned it, whispering, Please, please, please. And the door opened. She rushed inside, leaving the door open for anyone else who might want to escape this way. Except, she now realized as she ran along the dark passageway, the moonlight from behind her just barely lighting the way, this might not be an escape. She might end up lost inside this enormous palace, unable to find her way back to the garden or back to the front. But when she came to a simple staircase, she ran up it anyway. She reached the top stepped quietly around a screen, and found herself in a small sitting room. Moonlight filtered through the large windows, illuminating antique furniture, thick rugs, and old portraits of people Elle didn't recognize. The only sound was her breathing. She made for the door toward her right, then stopped when she realized there was another on the left side of the room. Crap, how was she supposed to know which way to go? Left? Right? Back down to the garden? but she felt an odd pull toward the door on the right. Hopefully, that was her directional instinct kicking in, if such a thing existed. She tiptoed to the door, opened it a sliver, and peeked out. The corridor beyond, embellished with wooden paneling and lamps sitting on decorative sconces, was empty. 
She closed the door quietly behind her and hurried along the corridor, trusting her instincts again and heading in the direction that felt right, rather than deliberating over which way was most likely to lead her to the front of the palace. She passed through another sitting room, then another corridor, and then a small dining room. More stairs, more turns, more portraits and tapestries and flower arrangements tall enough to reach the ceiling. She was aware with every passing second that she was probably about to land herself in enormous trouble, rather than escape it. But she couldn't stop. Something urged her forward. And so she hurried on. When she finally approached a set of wooden double doors with a pattern of leafy vines etched around the edge, it felt as if something that had been tightly coiled within her began to relax. This was the way out. She was sure of it. She put her ear against the door, but all she heard was silence. A smothering, all-encompassing kind of silence. For several moments, she couldn't even hear her quick breaths or her racing heart. She pulled back quickly, away from the strange vacuum of sound. But silence was good, she reminded herself. It meant no one was on the other side of these doors. And this was definitely the right direction to head. So she gripped the knob of the right-hand door, twisted, and pushed the door open just enough to look beyond it. Warm light fell through the opening, and voices greeted her ears as abruptly as if a TV had just been switched on. She should turn and run, but she was too surprised to move. In the space of about three seconds, she took in the strange scene. A mixture of fae and vampires, all standing around a giant antique desk in the middle of a large study, discussing something while moving papers and diagrams around. Not fighting or arguing, as fae and vampires were prone to do. Looking for all the world as if they were working together. But that wasn't the strangest thing of all. No. The part that hit Elle in the gut and made her simultaneously burning hot and icy cold was the sight of the man standing behind the desk, pointing to a page and saying, Probably try to come from this side. It was definitely him this time. There was no mistake. Dex? Elle said. Silence. Every eye in the room swung toward her. In a flash of motion, two vampires were beside her. One grabbed her right arm and whipped her mask off, while the other took her left arm. The doors clanged shut behind her with a sizzle of magic. Your Highness, one of the vampires said, and Elle realized his words were directed at Dex. What do you want us to do with her? Chapter 8 Five Days Before the Moonlight Masquerade Ball Dex paced the stone floor of the dungeon beneath Xander's family's home. The dungeon hadn't been used in decades, at least not that Xander's family knew of. Take right now, for example. They had no idea a vampire sat bound in chains of magic beneath the polished floors of their stately home. The vampire, Azriel, had been here since the night before, when Xander and Ollie had spotted him in the vicinity of the bridge where that magic-wielding vampire had revealed himself. They'd knocked Azriel out with magic, a feat that was probably only possible because he didn't know it was coming, and brought him straight back here, far from the prying eyes of Dex's parents and everyone else at Belmont Palace. They'd given Azriel the night to sleep off the effects of the magic, but now that he was awake, it was time to get some useful information out of him. Has it been long enough? Dex asked. Still another minute, Ollie said, taking a look at his cell phone screen and continuing to tap one foot quietly against the floor. You're very impatient, Azriel commented, his eyes pinned on Dex. You should try some relaxation techniques. Meditation, perhaps. Xander took a step closer to Azriel muttering something about meditation and sticking things where the sun didn't shine. If Dex wasn't concerned with sparing his energy, he might have responded. But the truth spell he'd performed was a complicated one, and once it began working, it would tire both him and Azriel. Azriel more, since he would be the one struggling to hide the truth as the magic of the spell pulled it out of him. But Dex would suffer too. I know who you are, Azriel said to Dex, and that was enough to stop Dex mid-stride. 
don't let him get to you, he reminded himself. He was supposed to be the one in control here, not this vampire. I doubt it, he replied. You may have gone to a great deal of trouble to hide your face from the public, Azriel said. But I do my research. I know what everyone in your family looks like, Prince Dex. Dex forced himself not to show his alarm. So what if this vampire knew who he was? It made sense, given the main goal of the Allegiant vampires. He should have expected it. The alarm on Ollie's phone beeped shrilly, breaking the tense moment. A second later, Dex felt a tingle across his skin. Ollie quickly turned the alarm off. Okay, it should be working now. Yes, I felt it activate, Dex said. He stood in front of the chair Azriel was bound to and folded his arms. What are the Allegiant vampires planning? Azriel pressed his lips together for a long moment before giving in to the spell. They plan to kill the royal Fey family and place Vincenzo Savoy, last remaining heir of House Savoy, original rulers of this country, on the throne. Dex sighed. I know that already. I need to know specifics of when and how they're planning to move against my family. Well, then you'll have to be more specific with your questions. Dex narrowed his eyes. Let's start a little further back. I want to know how reliable your information is. How long have you been with the Allegiant? A little under two months. Dex frowned. Behind him, Ollie stopped tapping his foot. That isn't very long. And that isn't a question, Azriel replied. Were you working for Savoy in other ways before joining the Allegiant? No. Did you only recently decide to pledge your allegiance to Savoy? Azrael breathed out heavily before answering. No. Xander stepped in front of Dex and leaned closer to the vampire. Do you actually believe Vincenzo Savoy should be king? Azrael lifted his gaze and simply glared at him. Ask him the damn question, Xander muttered, straightening and turning away. With increasing curiosity, Dex repeated the question. Azrael seemed to struggle but the word that finally escaped his lips was, No. No? Then why are you working with the Allegiant vampires? Because they have... They have... Azrael shook his head and clenched his jaw, but he couldn't hold back the truth. They have Mariel. He finished in a rush of breath. Who's Mariel? The woman I love. Dex felt his brow furrow. That was the last thing he expected to hear. For a moment, his thoughts turned to Elle, which was crazy because he didn't love her. He was attracted to her, without a doubt, and if he was free to follow his heart wherever it wanted to go, then he might have come to love her. But as it stood, he barely knew her. Well, he knew her laugh and the exact blue of her eyes, and that she was one of only a handful of people who hadn't fled when she'd seen the darkness. Okay, so it was definitely more than just attraction, but focus, damn it, he instructed himself. Wow, so you actually have feelings, Xander said to Azriel. Sucks for you, doesn't it? Now! Dex glanced over his shoulder to see Ollie's elbow extended and Xander clutching his side. It probably does suck for him, Ollie pointed out. I know, I was being serious. Oh. Sorry, sometimes I can't tell with you. Dex looked away from them with a sigh. Okay, so just to clarify, he said to Azriel, do you believe vampires should rule this country? Azriel rolled his shoulders and tilted his head from side to side before answering. No. So you don't agree with anything the Allegiant are doing? No. And you wouldn't have tried to abduct El on numerous occasions if you hadn't been told to? No. Well, that was good. Dex suddenly felt considerably less animosity towards this vamp. Which means you should be working for us instead. Dex, Xander said, and there was a warning in his tone. What? 
Dex looked over his shoulder. It's true. The vamps who are helping us already aren't on the inside like Azrael is. He could be extremely valuable. I can't work with you, Azrael said. I told you why I'm with the Allegiant. I need to get Mariel back. That isn't going to happen if I flip sides. Well, obviously, they don't have to know that you flipped sides, Dex said. Look, we have vampires who are working with us already. They've been trying to help us discover exactly what the Allegiant are planning. Please, you can help us too. You can make a difference. You have vampires on your side? That doesn't sound like your father. He may be hosting a ball in your honor and inviting a few token vampires and shifters, but we all know that's just for show. He's made it clear in the past that he only trusts Faye, and it'll be a Fey woman he chooses as your bride. Dex let out a sound that was half grumble, half sigh. He'd always hated how the public seemed to know just as much about his life as he did, even when they weren't supposed to. Nowhere had it been mentioned that the point of the Moonlight Masquerade Ball was for him to find someone to marry because his father was tired of waiting for him to choose a bride. And yet, somehow, everyone knew. When I said our side, Dex said, ignoring Azrael's comment about the ball, I didn't mean my father. With a laugh that sounded like it cost him a great deal of effort, Azrael said, Treasonous thoughts from the king's son himself. Not at all. I don't plan to take anything from my father. On the contrary, I'm trying to help him keep his throne by figuring out what the Allegiant are up to. And unlike him, I do think other races can be trusted. So if they're able to help me, then I'm happy to work with them. Well, that still doesn't give me much incentive to help you, Azriel said. I may be opposed to Allegiant vampires ruling this part of the world, but that doesn't mean I think your father should remain on the throne. Dex pressed his lips together. He happened to agree with Azriel, but that wasn't something he was supposed to even think, let alone speak out loud. One day there will be a new king, he said quietly. Don't you think it would be better if the kingdom that exists at that point in the future is a happy, united one, instead of a war-torn mess? Yes, Azriel said. He sighed and closed his eyes. But it doesn't matter what I think. I can't help you even if I wanted to. Fine, then you can help by answering a whole lot more questions. When are the Allegiant planning to make their move against the Fey royal family? I don't know. But you must have heard something. Dex pressed. Rumors or whispers? Azriel remained silent with his eyes closed. That wasn't actually a question, Ollie pointed out. Yes, fine, okay. Dex muttered. Have you heard any rumors of when the Allegiant will make a move against the royal family? Azrael sucked in a breath and tried to hold it in. Yes, he said finally. What is this rumor? They will attack at... at... The vampire clenched his teeth together, but he was weakening now, and he couldn't hold his words back for more than a moment. The ball. A shiver raced down Dex's spine. He exchanged a glance with Xander and then Ollie. That would be a stupid move, Xander muttered. But Dex was thinking back to the bridge and the vampire with magic and the conversation he'd had with El where he wondered out loud if there might be more of them. Are the Allegiant vampires aware there will be plenty of security? He asked. Yes. Plenty of fey guards and magical security? Yes. The shadow of apprehension grew in Dex's mind. Is the vampire with magic going to be part of this rumored attack at the Moonlight Masquerade Ball? A pause. Another deep breath. But Azriel was struggling now. Y yes Though Dex feared he knew the answer already, he asked, Will there be more vampires with magic at this rumored attack at the ball? Azrael stamped his foot and bit his lip, but the answer was unmistakable when it escaped him. Yes. How? Dex demanded. 
How have vampires acquired magic? But Azriel's eyelids slid closed, and his shoulders slumped as his head fell forward. Great, Xander muttered. We'll have to carry on later. At least we know they're planning to hit the ball, Ollie said. Well, we don't know that for sure, Dex reminded him. Apparently, that's only a rumor. Better to be careful, though. You should speak to your father about this. See if you can get him to cancel the event. Dex shook his head. You know he won't. I mean, I can speak to him, so at least he's aware of the possibility. But he won't cancel the ball just because of a rumor. He's probably received a dozen threats already. That always happens, and they're almost always hoaxes. Except for when they're not, Xander said grimly. This is different. If an army of magical vampires gets onto the palace grounds, the guards may not be enough to stop them, even though they're fey. I'm aware of that, Dex said, and I'll tell my father what I know. But I'll be surprised if he takes this threat seriously. You know he doesn't believe anything will ever threaten his reign. Yes, we know that very well, Ollie muttered. So the best we can do is plan for an attack and hope it doesn't happen, Dex said. He pinched the bridge of his nose and took a deep breath. I need some fresh air or I'm going to fall asleep. Sorry, man, that spell's a rough one, Ollie said. Should we go get some breakfast? Yeah, it's probably ready by now, Xander said, sliding his phone from his pocket and looking at the screen. Not quite the spread we get at Dex's place, but my parent's chef isn't too bad. Your parent's chef is amazing, Ollie said as he and Xander walked out of the dungeon ahead of Dex. Didn't he win all those awards last year? No, that was the last chef. He threatened to leave and go get a job at the palace, so my mom fired him. This guy was on one of those TV shows. Dex looked back at Azriel, letting Xander and Ollie's conversation become background noise. There were still so many questions to ask. How do these vampires get their magic? Why did they want L? And what were all the human abductions about? They slipped out of the dungeon and around the back of the house so no one would see where they'd come from. When they reached the pool, Dex said, You guys go ahead. I'll see you inside. I just need some sunlight and fresh air. Xander nodded, but Ollie paused. Is everything okay? You've been kind of weird since last night. Yes, sorry, I'm fine. Dex attempted a smile. It's just a whole new threat we didn't realize we had to fight. Vampires with magic. I'm just wrapping my head around it, that's all. And wrapping his head around the fact that L was a slave. To be honest, it was L who'd filled his mind every time he woke last night, not the threat of a magic-wielding vampire. How could she be a slave? And how was he supposed to move on without ever seeing her again? He had so many questions. He wanted to help. Surely he could do something to free her. He sat down on the warm paving stones beside the pool. What he actually needed to do was focus on more urgent matters, like vampires possibly showing up at the ball on Saturday, he would have to. A shadow fell across him, and he immediately jumped to his feet. Oh, sorry, he said, when he saw it was a fey woman with a black umbrella, and not a vampire about to launch a magical attack on him. Which he should have realized was unlikely, given the bright morning sun. You startled me, that's all, he said with an awkward laugh. The woman looked vaguely familiar. One of Xander's sister's friends, perhaps. I don't want to hurt you, she said. A chill raised the hairs on the back of Dex's neck. Excuse me? And then he recognized her. If he took away the pointed ears and imagined her with red eyes instead of blue, she was the vampire who'd led Elle upstairs at Gisela Monroe's party. The vampire who'd then attacked him while he was trying to get hold of Azriel. He raised his hands, gold dust already flashing at his fingertips but pain cracked through his skull. He sensed himself falling as darkness gathered in his vision, and the last thing he saw was the vampire frowning down at him. Chapter 9 
About half an hour later, Dex sat with Xander and Ollie in Xander's father's home office, checking the security footage. Yep, there they are, Xander said, nodding at the computer screen. Two vamps, each with a blackout umbrella. Brave, Ollie murmured. Those things don't always work well. And there they are again, less than two minutes later, leaving with a third vampire and a third umbrella. Xander swiveled in the desk chair to face Dex. So they found the dungeon, broke through the dungeon gate, and threw Asriel's chains, probably with magic they're not supposed to have, and got him off the property in under two minutes. How did they know we were holding a vampire here? Dex demanded. You said you weren't followed last night. Yeah, well, maybe I was wrong. I didn't think anyone saw us, but vampires are fast and stealthy. Man, this sucks, Ollie mumbled. It took us so long to get our hands on one of them, and we didn't even get to ask half our questions. Dex pushed away from the desk and stood. He walked to the window and ruffled his hair as he stared out. He could see the tall towers and glittering domes of Belmont Palace not too far away. His home. His prison. He would have to get back soon. He'd promised his mother he would join her for tea. Well, she'd insisted, and he'd given up on trying to find excuses. Telling her he had far more important things to do, which was the truth, never worked out well. Hey, Xander. Dex looked toward the door as Xander's younger brother walked into the room. Some shifter chick is here to see you, he said. Oh. Xander sat a little straighter. Did you tell security to let her in? No, I told them to keep her outside and watch her every move. Beckett. Xander sighed. She's not going to bite you, little bro. I don't care. She's your problem, not mine. You go deal with her. Just make sure she's gone before the parentals see her. You don't get to tell me what to do, Xander shouted after him. Ollie raised his eyebrows. So mature. What? I'm older than he is. I should be the one bossing him around. Not when it comes to shifters, it would seem, Ollie said. Yeah, well, you know how my family feels about shifters, Xander said swinging his chair back to face the computer. Apparently, they're as bad as vamps. He clicked through the various security camera feeds until landing on the one from the front gate. Oh, looks like it's Astrid. Dex leaned over the desk for a closer look. The girl's honey-colored hair was piled on top of her head in a messy bun, and she was staring up the camera with her arms crossed over her chest. Yeah, that's Astrid. Must be something important if she's come all the way over here. Xander picked up the phone beside the computer and called the front gate to let her in. The three of them headed outside to meet her in the garden, and her grumpy expression disappeared when she saw Dex. Oh, hey, I'm actually looking for you. Xander let out a sigh. Most women generally are. Astrid rolled her eyes and punched his shoulder. Not like that, you moron. She turned to Dex. Anyway, I've been trying to reach you. Rothman said you weren't at home, so I figured you might be here. Sorry, I haven't looked at my phone for a while. He got hit on the head by a vampire. Xander supplied. Dex glared at him. Thank you for sharing that. Anytime. Xander answered flashing his favorite, I know I'm pissing you off right now, grin. Dex turned his attention back to Astrid. Everything okay? Is it something about the Allegiant? No, it's about the godmother, actually. I saw her at the Red Lane Cafe when I was grabbing a coffee this morning. She was meeting this older guy, Faye, and they spoke for quite a while. You're sure it was her? Yes, I mean... She's probably long gone now, since I couldn't reach you sooner. But you said you wanted to hear about any sightings, anywhere, any time of day, so... Yeah, this is good. Dex said with a nod. Thanks. I'll go check it out, even though she's probably gone. Astrid twirled a stray piece of hair around one finger. 
You ready to tell any of us yet why you're after her? You said you don't want a wish from her, which makes me even more curious. Dex glanced at Ollie and Xander. They were the only ones who knew, and they would take the secret to their graves unless Dex told them otherwise. Nope, sorry, he said to Astrid. Still keeping that one to myself. And that's the way it would stay. Taking on the godmother was personal. No one else needed to get involved. Chapter 10 Four Days Before the Moonlight Masquerade Ball Azrael didn't often find himself face to face with the Vampire King himself, and when he did, it was never a pleasant experience. Today was no different. Leb had informed him early that morning that their Lord King, who was not yet a king, Azrael always wanted to point out, required an audience with him. And so he dutifully traveled to the closest eternal night, which was where Vincenzo Savoy currently resided, and crossed into a land of darkness. The eternal nights, pockets of land scattered here and there around the world, had existed for many centuries, long enough that no one remembered exactly how they'd come into being. Magic, most likely, which meant the Fae had possibly been involved. And yet the Fae, who had longer lives than vampires, knew of the existence of only a few of the eternal nights. The location of the others was a closely guarded secret among vampires. The Fae King Belleric had no idea that one of the eternal nights existed within his own country. You let me down, Vincenzo Savoy said to Azrael that afternoon. He sat on his throne, an imposing chair made of black glass, while Azrael was required to kneel before him. The room was devoid of all other furnishings, but large windows provided dramatic views of the rocky landscape and the starless, moonless night sky. Azrael had heard that the rest of the palatial home was tastefully decorated in shades of red and turquoise, but perhaps Savoy didn't want anything to divert his followers' attention from himself while in this throne room. I can still prove myself to you, my lord king, Azriel said. That was how Savoy liked to be addressed, and though it made Azriel want to throw up, he would say whatever he had to in order to free Mariel from this place. I wanted you for your superior strength, speed, and tracking skills, but you failed to get me the girl. Azriel focused on the polished gray floor at his feet. I can still get El Winter for you. You're too late, Azriel. We'll have to make do without her now, which means I have no further use for you. There must be something else I can do for you, my Lord King. There isn't, which, to be honest, is a relief. I've been waiting months to see your face when Muriel tells you the truth. Azriel raised his gaze a few inches, just enough to focus on Savoy's shoes. What truth? This conversation is over. A moment of silence passed before footsteps entered the room. Azriel looked behind him as two men and two women filed into the room. He recognized three of them. They were enhanced, like he was. He wondered if they'd chosen to be here, or if they were also being coerced in some way. Get rid of him, Savoy said. Wait, please. Azriel stood quickly. I can give you information. I know who it is that's been protecting the girl. Prince Chevalier. And how does that help me? Savoy asked. It only makes it less likely that I'll ever get my hands on her. He's been acting without his father's permission. There are vampires working with him. At that, Savoy finally appeared to pay attention. Give me names, and I might reconsider your worth to me. I don't have names. I didn't have long enough to speak with the prince. But if you give me more time... And here we go again. It's always more time with you, Azriel. That's because it takes time to do a job properly. Oh, just give up already, would you? This is over. 
You can't save Mariel. She never needed saving. You fell for her tricks, like so many love-struck men before you. Asriel let his eyes fall shut as he tried to gather his patience. I know you're lying, he said. Am I? Yes. Mariel wouldn't have helped me and all the others escape if she was only ever out to trick me. Savoy laughed. She didn't help any of you escape. She brought you all to me. She wanted full payment, you see. She didn't want to share with dear daddy. What a convenient story, Asriel said, opening his eyes and fixing his glare on the pretend king he hated. But that's all it is. I know what you're trying to do, but your lies won't work on me. Savoy's lips curled into a condescending smile. Does it even matter? I have no use for you anymore, Asriel. The only way you could change that is if you bring me Estelle Winter, since I can use her information for our future plans, if not right now. But I'm tired of giving you more chances only to watch you fail. Not this time, Asriel murmured as he turned and launched past the guards. He sprinted as if his life depended on it, which it did, but he sensed the guards close behind him. He was usually confident he could outrun any pursuer, but not this time. This time, he had no idea if he was faster. Death might finally catch up to him. But this was his last chance to get his hands on that damn human girl, and if he got out of here alive, he would tear down her home piece by piece just to get past the vampire protection. None of this waiting around for her to come out, or looking out for her at parties, or agreeing to meet her at random locations. The cops would be gone from her street by now. The security on her home was minimal. This game was over. Chapter 11 The Present Elle's eyes remained fixed on Dex, his parted lips, his furrowed brow, as the two vampires dragged her to the center of the study somewhere inside Belmont Palace. I thought there was a charm on the door, one of them said. The sound charm was definitely there, someone else in the room replied. I did it myself. Who was supposed to do the lock charm? Quiet, Dex said. He straightened and wiped the startled expression from his face. Hurrying around the desk and coming toward Elle, he added, You can let her go. She's on our side. You're... I don't understand, Elle said. He called you... Elle? He said, Your Highness, to you. Her eyes flicked to the vampire hovering nearby, watching her with a wary expression. Yes, Dex said carefully. He did. But... but the man in the ballroom... The man in the gold mask. Everyone's following him around and... And he's not actually a prince. Dex filled in quietly. So, you're him. The prince? Prince Chevalier? Dex grimaced as he nodded, as if admitting to something embarrassing. But you're Dex. He made another face. Chevalier, Adex, Norville, Belmont... A pompous mouthful, and the only normal bit I've ever been able to extract is Dex, so that's what people call me. Well, if they expect me to answer, that's what they call me. And the guy out there in the gold mask is? My body double. I'm not supposed to be using him tonight. My parents don't know. But that ridiculous ball is the last place I want to be, and my father made things a lot easier when he decided this party should include masquerade masks. Elle blinked a few times. Dex gave her a sheepish smile. So you're really... You're him, she said. Yes, I'm him. I mean, me. He's me. Your Highness? Someone asked. You know what I'm trying to say, Dex grumbled. It makes sense now, Elle murmured. This was why the godmother said it had to be her. This was why she'd been so sure the prince would follow Elle anywhere. 
she must have seen something when she took Elle's hand. Seen that Elle and Dex had spent time together, had almost kissed. And that extra magic she'd added, something about making it easier to find the prince, was what had led Elle to this room. She hadn't found it by accident. Every pole around every corner was because of the godmother's magic. The godmother. Who wanted her to kill the guy she'd slowly been falling for. It struck Elle only now that she had failed to pay the godmother's price. And there was nothing on earth that could convince her to follow through on her side of the deal now. She would never get that wish. She was still a slave, and she would remain that way. What makes sense? Dex asked. Um, nothing. The sound of shouts and something crashing nearby made everyone turn toward the door. What's happening out there? Dex asked. Oh, right, of course. Allegiant vampires. Elle said hastily. With magic, they were in the ballroom. So Asriel was right, Dex said. What? Elle asked. They can't possibly know we're in here, a fey woman said. We can hear them, but they can't hear us. Does that matter? Another woman asked. They're probably breaking down every door they come across. She was human, Elle realized, with honey-colored hair and pretty hazel eyes. She leaned against the desk, and the lamp that was sitting atop a stack of papers shone directly up into her eyes, making her pupils shift shape for a moment. Shifter, not human, Elle corrected silently. Your Highness someone behind Elle said. We should... A resounding crash interrupted him, and the door splintered open. Stars above! Elle gasped. Magic zapped across the room from multiple sources, creating a shimmering barrier between them and their attackers. Dex grabbed her hand and rushed to the wall, where he pressed his shoulder against one of the wood panels. Then he tugged her into the darkness beyond. Chapter 12 they raced through hidden passageways between the walls, magic lighting their way. Elle had no idea if the footsteps and shouts behind her were friend or foe, and the fear that phantom hands might grab hold of her at any moment chased her around every corner. Split up, Dex called back at one point, and Elle saw a moment later that the passage branched three different ways. Dex pulled her to the left, and she followed without question. The noises behind her diminished as the group she was running with grew smaller. I hope, she gasped. All those people in the ballroom are okay. They should be fine, Dex answered. I warned my father about this. He didn't believe the threat was real, so he wouldn't cancel the ball. But he did increase security, extra guards and magic, protective charms in the champagne, to be handed out to all non-vampires. In the champagne? Elle thought. And the prince, the fake prince, had drunk champagne. Was the protection enough to counter the effects of the potion she'd given him? Hopefully, since he was the wrong guy. Okay, slow down, Dex said, and Elle almost bumped into him. And don't say anything, he added. We're approaching the ballroom. All the mirrors on this side of the ballroom back onto this passage. We'll be able to see through them into the... No way, someone hissed behind them. It sounded like one of the vampires who'd first grabbed her. Elle looked back and saw two or three others behind her. You can't stop there, the vampire said. I have to, Dex replied. I need to know what's going on. They might need my help in there. If they do, I can throw magic through those air vents along the bottom of the wall, and you guys can take Elle. Don't be stupid, the vampire said. Your Highness, he added quickly. There might be a legion vampires chasing us through these passages still, and if you end up dead along with the rest of your family, then Savoy will have won. None of us want that. We have to keep moving and get to that garden you mentioned. I'm not going to end up dead. Shh, El said, looking ahead and seeing patches of light filtering into the passage. They had just about reached the ballroom. Dex hurried forward, still pulling her along, and stopped at the first mirror. It looked like most of the guests had fled, but fey guards and vampires were still fighting, along with a few people in tuxedos and ball gowns who'd somehow become involved in the fray. Fragments of plates and glasses littered the floor, 
and flashes of gold illuminated the room like fireworks. My parents, Dex whispered, and Elle followed his gaze toward the stairs. They must have been in the ballroom earlier. Where else would they have been? But Elle was so focused then on finding the prince that she hadn't spared them a thought. But there they were now, near the top of the stairs, with a ring of guards in front of them deflecting magic and throwing their own spells. And then, with a bright flare of sparks, one of the guards fell. A vampire sped forward, throwing both arms out. Was it Nick? El was almost sure it was. His magic zigzagged away from him like lightning, through the gap in the line of guards, heading straight for King Belleric. No! El gasped. Dex's hand clenched so tightly around hers, she thought her fingers might break. But both of them stood frozen, watching the terrible scene, knowing it was too late to do a thing. The magic struck the king and rebounded instantly. A darkness, like ink or shadows, or some strange combination of both, radiated out from him, mixed with the glittering gold of fairy dust. It arced over the guard and struck every remaining vampire, throwing them clear across the room. Not one of them moved again. Elle realized she was holding her breath. From the silence around her, it seemed the others were doing the same. Then, what the hell kind of magic was that? Someone murmured behind her. They're okay, Dex whispered. I think everyone's okay. And Elle's brain chose that moment to remember Dex telling her his greatest fear was his father, and then a terrible thought crossed her mind. Would he have been relieved if his father had died tonight? Oh, hell, they're still coming, someone said. What? Dex looked back and finally loosened his grip on Elle's hand. Allegiant in the passages, keep moving, get to the garden. They rushed past the ballroom. Images of destruction flickered in Elle's peripheral vision with every mirror that flashed by. And then they were in the darkened passages again, turning this way and that, almost stumbling over each other around corners and downstairs. Elle would have been utterly lost on her own. I think they're gaining on us. We're almost at the gate, Dex shouted back. I can't tell if they're... Ah! Elle stumbled into Dex as he slowed and looked back. She twisted around. In the dim light of glowing fairy dust, all she could see was one figure on the floor, the vampire, struggling to get up, and another two, a man and woman, with magic brightening at their fingertips. A little further back along the passage, dark shapes raced toward them. Magic flew from the hands of the two fairies, speeding through the air in a rush of sparks and wind that slowed their attacker's advance. Out the way, Dex gasped in Elle's ear. Time seemed to slow as his arm came around her and swept her against his right side while he pivoted his left to face the oncoming threat. He thrust his left hand forward, and a pulse of glittering magic shot away from him. Flames rushed past his fey companions and over the vampire busy dragging himself upright. A wall of fire formed across the passage. Run, Dex said, spinning around again and pulling Elle with him. They reached a metal gate, which Dex shoved open. He flattened himself against the wall as the others rushed through. The vampire, despite being injured, seemed to have no problem keeping up with the Fae. The gate clanged shut, and Dex said, Help me reinforce this, as he raised his palm to the metal bars. The other two Fae joined him, and bright gold light flashed along the crisscrossing bars. Then, once again, they were running, curving to the right and then racing up more stairs. The skirt of Elle's dress was bunched in one hand, while her other hand held on tightly to Dex. Crystal heels most definitely would not have helped me tonight, she thought as they reached the top of the stairs. There was a ceiling directly above them, but Dex placed his palm against it, and after a moment of glowing fairy dust, a circular portion of the ceiling disappeared. Dex climbed through the hole, then reached back to help Elle. The first thing she saw was a bench, but as she stepped hurriedly around it, adrenaline still racing through her body, she took in a garden full of roses, ivy-entwined archways, and trees with slender branches and softly glowing pink and white blossoms. Are we supposed to be running still? She gasped, twisting to face Dex as her lungs continued to struggle for breath. But Dex was crouched on the ground, 
sealing the hole they just climbed through, and one of the fairies was examining the vampire's shoulder as he dropped onto the bench. No. Dex stood in reach for El's hand. We'll be safe here. Chapter 13 Are you okay? Dex asked. It took El a moment to process the question. Was she okay? I... yes, I think so. Good. Dex squeezed her hand before looking at his vampire friend. Are you okay? Yeah, of course. A strained smile pulled at his lips. You Fay are frustratingly slow. I could have gotten to the garden within seconds if you hadn't all been in my way. One of the fairies rolled her eyes. He's fine. Okay, see if you can contact the others and find out where they ended up. Dex said to the other fairy. Hopefully everyone reached one of the safe zones and took out a bunch of Allegiant vampires in the process. Elle's mind flashed briefly back to the ballroom. Whatever the king had done, it had definitely taken out all the vampires left in that room. Elle? Dex said. She blinked at him and sucked in another deep breath. Do you want to talk? She nodded, and he led her away from the other three. We're safe here, he told her again. This section of the garden has always been well protected by magic. It's my mother's favorite part of the grounds, but I placed extra wards around it over the past few days, as well as in another few spots around the palace. I just thought, well, I didn't know what to expect. You never know if you might need to send people to a safe place to hide. They stopped beneath one of the blossom-laden trees. Okay, wait, Elle said. Just wait. I have about a thousand questions, and I'm still trying to catch my breath. She bent over, pressed her palms against her knees, and took a few slow breaths. She swallowed, then straightened. You're freaking Prince Chevalier! His lips twitched as though he might be trying to hide a smile. Yes, we went over that bit already. Oh, well, forgive me if my mind is still in the process of being blown by this revelation. This time, he didn't hide his smile. Forgive me if my mind is blown to see you standing here in my home, looking... He shook his head. Like the most beautiful woman to ever walk through the doors of this palace. Elle's cheeks burned. I, no, don't do that. She took a step back. I'm trying to put puzzle pieces together in my head and you're making it difficult. Elle, I thought I would never see you again. You were just gone. And you left your phone there. And you were in so much pain because of that awful slave charm. And I had so many questions. I have so many questions, she said, mentally shoving aside the reminder that she was still a slave. A slave, for goodness sake. Standing in front of a prince. Like, how do you go out into the city all the time without anyone recognizing you? Well, hardly anyone knows what I look like, so it's easy. But how have you gone this long without people knowing what you look like? Why aren't there any recent photos of you? And you were blonde when you were a kid, just by the way, and now your hair is dark. So that's just really confusing. I mean, I would never have guessed that you could be him. He quirked an eyebrow. Really? My hair color is the sole reason you would never have guessed I'm actually a prince? Oh, come on, just answer my questions. Okay, okay. But that smile of his was still there, and she kind of wanted to smile in return. This was Dex, standing right in front of her. Like him, she thought they would never see one another again. She thought he might even be repulsed by the fact that he'd almost kissed her. But he was looking at her now as though nothing in the world could draw his attention away from her face. That is, until his expression clouded and he looked down. It's because of the darkness, he said quietly. Darkness? Like, with a capital D? Yes. Well, that's the way I think of it. You're talking about the thing that happened the other night in the warehouse? Elle asked. Yes. It started happening years ago, 
and my parents investigated all sorts of ways to try to cure me of it. One thing my mother came across was the suggestion that curses can be cast over the image of someone. It's an old wives' tale, and that's not even how this whole darkness thing started, but it freaked her out. She thought someone could make me even sicker if they wanted to. Since then, she hasn't allowed anyone to take photos of me. Elle couldn't help her quiet chuckle. So Meredith was actually right about those rumors. Well, partly right. Dex groaned. Do I want to know what rumors you're referring to? They're not so bad. She just said that Prince Chevalier never leaves the palace because he has an immune deficiency or something, and she also mentioned that it's bad luck to photograph Faye who are seriously ill, which is why there are no recent photos of him. Dex sighed. I always wonder how these little bits of the truth get out there and fuel all the rumors about me and my family. Anyway, the no-photo rule is ridiculous and unnecessary, but I've used it to my advantage. Since no one knows what I look like, no one recognizes me when I sneak away from here and go into the city. And no one's ever figured out who you are? Like someone who's visited the palace and then happens to see you at a party like Gisela Monroe's? There isn't really much overlap of the crowd I mix with out there and the people who visit Belmont Palace. Actresses, singers, they're not really my father's kind of people. Most of them don't have a noble history attached to their family name. And, well, it helps that I don't form attachments with people out there. I don't share my number with people or make plans to meet up a second time. If I did, it would become harder to keep the truth of who I am a secret. So, the other night at the apothecary, Elle said carefully, her heart beating faster as the memory of almost kissing him flashed across her mind. How does that fit into your philosophy of not forming attachments? It doesn't. Dex moved closer and took both her hands in his. I've broken quite a few of my rules when it comes to you. She couldn't look away, and she didn't want to ruin the moment, but she had to say something. She had to remind him of the truth. Dex, I'm... I'm a slave. I don't care he said simply. Then he frowned. I mean, I do care. Nobody should ever have had the right to enslave you, and I want to know who did it so I can personally make sure that you're freed. What I mean is, it doesn't change what I think of you. But even if I'm free, she wanted to remind him that she would still be human, and he was a fey prince. What more could possibly happen between them other than a kiss? Dex stepped closer, and his shoe bumped into hers. He looked down and started laughing. What? she asked, looking down. Oh. The bottom of her dress had been torn at some point since she'd fled the ballroom, and her sparkly combat boots were now sticking out the bottom. So, uh, I know they don't go with the dress. They were never meant to be visible. They're perfect, he said. She rolled her eyes. They're definitely not perfect. I mean, they're perfectly you. Well, I'm glad you think so, because the woman who dressed me... His lips pressed against hers, cutting off her remaining words. She was so startled she couldn't move, couldn't think, couldn't breathe. But then Dex's hand slid up her arms and around her waist, and something inside her melted. Her eyelids fluttered shut as he pulled her against him, and her hands, somehow, were gliding up to his shoulders. His lips moved against hers, and a tiny panicked voice screamed, I don't know what I'm doing. But there were far too many other sensations to lose herself in. His hands pressing into her back, the taste of his tongue, the goosebumps rushing across her skin. When the warmth of his lips eventually vanished from hers, she was flushed and embarrassingly breathless. Sorry I interrupted you. Dex murmured before kissing her lightly again. I didn't want to miss my chance a second time around. That's... that's okay. Holy exploding stars, it was definitely okay. He placed his hands gently on either side of her face and kissed her again. When he pulled away, her eyes finally opened but she was far too shy to meet his gaze. Was I terrible? He let out a quiet laugh. No, not at all. But 
you know. She dared to look at him. We should probably practice some more anyway. His grin told her he fully understood the hint. Definitely. He kissed her lips again, and then her jaw. And then he was murmuring, Didn't you say you have about a thousand questions for me? Mm-hmm. She found his lips again as her hand slid around his neck. Just, just give me a minute, she said between kisses. And I'll, I'll think of them. He laughed quietly against her mouth. I think there were some things I wanted to ask you, too. Isn't it funny how I can't remember a single one, either? Elle chuckled, and then her breath caught in her throat as something wrapped around her middle and tugged her away from Dex. What the? Elle. She stumbled backward, but managed to keep herself from tripping. Looking down, she found there was nothing around her waist, but something was definitely pulling. What was that? Dex asked, coming closer. What just happened? Somewhere in the distance, a bell chimed. Then it chimed again. Suddenly, Elle knew exactly what was happening. She met Dex's eyes for a moment, just long enough to whisper, Midnight. And then the godmother's magic yanked her clear across the garden. Hey! Dex yelled, racing after her. Her feet left the ground and she was swirling through the air, past the trees and archways and the bench where Dex's companions were sitting. She caught a glimpse of them jumping up and joining Dex before the godmother's spell spun her higher and higher as she flew faster. And then, a cry escaped Elle as she rammed into something hard and invisible in the air. Magic sparked around her as her body seemed to roll against an invisible barrier. The wards? She wondered. Dex said there was lots of magic around this part of the garden and that he'd placed extra wards here. She almost managed to smile despite the fact that magic was busy tossing her around high above the ground. Surely all the wards here were stronger than whatever simple spell the godmother had placed on her. They would keep her inside this garden, and Dex would find a way to get her down. But her momentary relief vanished when something began to tug her higher. Higher and higher, she was gaining speed, and she just had time to wonder if the wards were in the shape of a dome or were more like walls when she felt herself suddenly tossed sideways. She let out an angry cry as her body sped over the palace grounds, heading in the direction of Vale City. She couldn't let this happen. She couldn't go home to Salvia. Dex had promised to free her, and she had to get back to him, to tell him she needed a wish. It was as simple as that. Maybe he could get her one. The royal family probably had dozens of wishes lined up next to their jewelry and crowns and designer watches. As she swirled low enough to touch the trees, she tried to grab hold of branches and leaves, but they tore through her fingers, leaving scratches on her palms. Damn it, just slow down, she yelled, but of course the magic didn't listen. Her body somersaulted through the air, and when she was upright again, she discovered her hairstyle had unraveled itself. And then, holy stars, her dress vanished in the blink of an eye. She let out a startled yelp, then breathed again when she realized she was back in her jeans and t-shirt and not naked. She had a feeling that if she could look in a mirror, she'd find all her makeup gone too. She tried to push her hair out of her eyes and saw that she was finally nearing the palace itself. Zooming toward it faster and faster, and crap, she was going to slam straight into the wall but at the last moment, with her eyes closed and a scream tearing itself from her throat, Elle swooped up and up and up and flew right over the top of Belmont Palace. She lost height so quickly on the other side that she thought the magic had dropped her. But it caught her just before her feet brushed the polished tiles outside the entrance and sent her soaring forward just above the stairs. She was close to the railing on one side of the staircase, so she reached for it, hoping to grab hold of one of the balusters. Her hand slapped against them as she passed, and then finally, she grabbed hold of one. Her body slammed against the railing, and the force of the magic threatened to pull her arm from its socket, but she held on with all her strength. She wrapped both arms around the baluster, then wedged her boots in between two balusters farther down. Just try to pull me away now, 
she said through gritted teeth, aware of how extremely odd she would look to anyone who happened to walk up or down these stairs right now. The magic, as if it could hear her and had decided to respond, suddenly pulled backwards instead of forwards. Then it tried to spin her body. As she jerked to the side, her upper body lost its grip on the baluster. No, she gasped, her hands flailing, trying to catch hold again. And though her boots were firmly stuck between the two balusters further down, the magic tugged and tugged until she felt her feet begin to slip free of them. No, 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 she gasped. Why hadn't she tied the darn laces tighter? Before another thought could cross her mind, the magic had sucked her clean out of her shoes, and she was flying away again. Then a hand grabbed hers, jerking her to a halt. Oh, thank goodness, she gasped, looking back and expecting to see Dex's face. But it was someone else whose powerful grip was slowly pulling her back, hand over hand, fighting against the godmother's magic. I don't know what spells got hold of you, he said, but I'm willing to bet I'm stronger. He reached the top of her arm and grabbed her shoulders, then pulled her against his chest, wrapping his arms around her to keep her from flying away. Elle, shaking now, looked up into familiar red eyes. Got you, Azriel said. And this time, I'm taking you where no one will find you. This has been City of Wishes, a Cinderella story, Episode 3. The Moonlight Masquerade, written by Rachel Morgan and narrated by Ariel Delisle. The story continues in Episode 4, The Eternal Night. Alternatively, for the full story, search for City of Wishes, The Complete Cinderella Story.